Good morning, everybody. It's exciting to be here today, and I'm glad you're here. Um, welcome to Regional Solutions, our Regional Solutions event. Um, it's zoning reform for housing attainability, and many of you know me, but if you don't, my name is Helen Peters. I'm the Director of Regional Planning and Transportation for Salt Lake County, which is housed in the Office of Regional Development, directed by Dina Blaze. Um, this morning, um, not only are we delighted to have you here for this important discussion, but I hope you'll help me welcoming Mayor Jenny Wilson to the stage to give some brief welcoming remarks. Mayor Wilson. Thank you, Helen. Well, this particular conference um, has been something that I, that I look forward to every year um, because I know the importance of this work. And um, I see so many friends in the audience and people in the community that are out there really doubling down on making a difference with our greatest challenges. And we know right now that um, we continue to want to make sure our streets are flowing well, our highways. Um, we know we're facing a housing crisis. We know that growth um, can be our enemy or our friend. And each of you in this room has a role at really um, doing things in this community that sometimes our neighbors, our friends, to really get, right? Because we take these things for granted. We take for granted the fact that we can live in a community where we can get up. I know that some of you live in Salt Lake County, many of you out of county and still get here on time because the roads are flowing. And we live in a community um, up until now where we really have taken for granted, up until now meaning, meaning a few years ago, that um, somebody who works hard, doubles down on their education, invests in um, good things will be able to own a home or at least a good apartment. And I'm telling you, when that is compromised, um, we're in a really, really tough time. So the work that is done in this room today, the lessons learned, the takeaways um, will be well applied, I know, by each of you in your various sectors. So this audience consists of planners, policymakers, affordable housing advocates, developers, academic, academia, media, others. Um, and I really do appreciate that wide spectrum of engagement here today. So we began um, this uh, series of events in 2018, and we are looking to inspire that collective action. And I want to thank um, the entire regional development team, Dina Blaze, who's here, her team, Helen. You all have done such a great job at being intentional and knowing what this audience wants to hear and pulling it together. Um, and I really believe, I have two boys, I want to see hopefully my future grandkids, um, if that ever happens, um, have the same quality of life that I enjoyed in this community as a child. And um, I appreciate that uh, I lived in this community, I lived in this community for many years and then just out of college I'm like, I got to get out of Utah. I went to Washington DC, had that great experience, um, lived in the Boston area, but coming back to Utah it is a very special place, and we, I want my future grandkids to be able to have that accessibility to the fundamental um, components of life that I've already mentioned. And the, these, again, are the things you all are working on, and, and sometimes, um, again, our friends and neighbors not be, maybe it was aware of the intentional work that goes into um, keeping us moving and doing a lot to address this housing afford affordability. Um, challenge. So um, this is a challenge that is bigger than any one of us, which is why these types of events are important. Um, addressing housing attainability, affordability um, impacts so many different sectors. And I'll tell you, we at Salt Lake County are committed uh, to figuring this out. Um, I'll tell you, it, when, when there's such a broad market force in a, an issue like this one, it's a little more challenging. Government interventions can be tricky. Um, we don't live in a state nor a nation where you really want to get into uh, a lot of um, tools that take away people's choice, right? And pass on the burden to someone else. So we have to be wise 
in the investments that are made and we have to figure out how to bring our um, business partners, our developers and builders to the table through that process. So um, I urge you to network here today, to have a chance to form some new partnerships, um, find that person that might be a next step in your own progress and the work that you're doing. Um, together, we can transform this challenge. We can um, get beyond uh, the, the one I believe, I, I hear the governor saying, you know, housing affordability is number one on his list. It is mine um, here at Salt Lake County and um, the great work of this team and you all in working together to, to change the tra trajectory and prove things um, so that my kids, hopefully their kids, your kids and grandkids and our broader community um, really has a chance to succeed through home ownership. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Wilson, again, for joining us this morning. Um, I want to just take a minute. My name is Dina Blaze. I'm the director of the Office of Regional Development at Salt Lake County. And one of our divisions, the Division of Regional Planning and Transportation, that's headed by Helen uh, Peters, um, is hosting this event today. It's been something, as the mayor said, we've been doing since 2018. And I think it's important just to recognize um, sort of why the county does this. Uh, many of you realize that the county has very little land use authority. The area of unincorporated county is very small, right? So we spend so much of our time collaborating with other regional organizations and or municipalities. So in the spirit of that is really why we kicked off this series of, of annual events. It's really an opportunity for the county to convene lots of differing points of view and really support kind of a civil, civil discourse on how do we solve our most wicked problems with regard to regional development. So we really do appreciate, and I want to underscore the point that the mayor said, that in this room, just looking around, are practitioners and advocates and academics and so forth. And I think it's just critical for us to restate how much we appreciate all of those points of view in this dialogue um, going forward. So I want to take a minute and thank our sponsors. Um, we, we have quite a few. American Society of Landscape Architects. We have Ivory Homes, um, AARP, and the Utah Land Use Institute. And I want to just take a moment. I don't know where Craig is. Where did Craig go? Craig, there's Craig. Craig, please absolve me of my sin of not putting your logo on the table. Things. Okay, I've known Craig for like 25 years and um, really, really support the work of the Utah Land Use Institute. And if any of you may be sort of fangirl like I do whenever you see Craig, I did not bring any of my books to get your autograph, Craig, but maybe later, okay? We'll work on that. We also want to thank um, the Utah Transit Authority for their support for the event, Century Financial and Rio Tinto, and of course, a special thanks to the Wasatch Front Regional Council as a co-sponsor of the event today. Um, we work so closely with Wasatch Front Regional Council, and it's almost like if you are not at one of our events, we just don't know what we're going to do with ourselves. So we really appreciate um, sort of the sage advice and guidance that we've provided from that organization in the past and really look forward to continuing our partnership with them on so many things. Um, our morning keynote speaker today is Dr. Ardnam Chakraborty. So exciting talking to him in the last couple of weeks. He serves as the dean of the University of Utah College of Architecture and Planning, is focusing on research related to zoning's impact on housing affordability and collaborative planning for improved social and environmental outcomes. Um, for the sake of time, we're going to just go straight. If you want to come up and join, join me on the, on the stage, that'd be great. And the other thing is, we are not going to spend a lot of time doing some deep, deep introductions of our speakers. Um, the QR code on your table tent, you can click on that and get sort of the full bio. Um, of Dr. Chakraborty, but I want to thank you so much for joining us. And new to new to Utah, if you want to take a few minutes and just give them a, a give everybody a, an, an outline of that. But we're really delighted that you could join us this morning. So I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dina, and thank you, Helen, and, and Madam Mayor, and, and Ryan, and everybody else um, for, for having me here and for the very warm and generous welcome I've received from this community. Um, this is a great opportunity and, and privilege for me to share some thoughts related to a very close area of research for me on which I've been working on a little over 20 years. Um, as Dina said, I moved to Utah recently uh, to take on the position of Professor of City and Metropolitan Planning and Dean of the College of Architecture and Planning at the University of Utah. Um, feel very fortunate and excited uh, to, to be here and in this role, of course, um, learning from many of the colleagues, students, and, and alums in the community uh, from, from the planning department and, and the college. Uh, but it's also been a great experience um, over the years learning about planning uh, in Utah and in Salt Lake City in particular, and over the last uh, four months or so that I've been here, uh, getting a first-hand uh, sort of exposure, first searching for a home, and then uh, making you know, some friends and, and finding information about the community uh, around these things. Um, clearly, housing affordability is a huge challenge uh, for, uh, for the nation at this point, and, and particularly in this community. And I can tell you, as a, as a leader of a college, uh, it is a huge uh, responsibility to, to contribute to and participate in as we try to attract uh, best and the brightest of students, faculty, and staff uh, from this community, from this region, as well as from, from around the globe. Um, so I am not just excited to be in this community as the dean of the college, but also to do this, work with all the leaders and practitioners in the region, uh, actively identify and work on solutions to the challenges that are facing our, our community. Uh, I have been asked to provide a bit of a context and perspective on the topic of zoning reform. Um, since I'm new to Utah, my presentation will uh, probably be more on the, the national trends in research and broader scale compared to uh, some of my fellow speakers and panelists here today. Um, and I also have the hour-long sort of teacher slot, uh, and, I, and I plan to speak for a little over half of it, so get comfortable. I know you have access to coffee uh, and stuff. Um, and I expect to hear a little bit of everything, actually, uh, from some definitional aspects of zoning reform, which many of you uh, might already be familiar with, um, to perhaps some new information. Uh, and don't worry, though, I won't show you any regression analysis. We talked about that last night. Uh, maybe, we'll see. Um, anyway, but uh, before I get into that formal part of the presentation, I just want to share a few more personal tidbits. Uh, a little over 20 years ago, uh, I was a doctoral student in, in urban planning and design, uh, interested in understanding why communities uh, across our nation find it so hard to coordinate on land use decisions. Um, I was reading through everything I could find on this topic, really. Uh, uh, from Judy Innes's work on, on land use as a tool for social control to Kenneth Jackson's work on crabgrass, frontier, and suburbanization of the, of the American landscape. Um, at that time, I came across uh, a somewhat new and yet somewhat seemingly a groundbreaking breaking effort uh, to coordinate regional decisions. Uh, and it was called Envision Utah. Uh, I wasn't familiar with Utah much at that time, to be honest. Uh, I'm originally from India. Uh, I was a few years into my graduate work uh, in the nation uh, here. But, but I felt that this work presented a very compelling idea for thinking about land use decisions, uh, both considering the broader spectrum of uh, economic and environmental and social outcomes of land use, uh, as well as proposing regional public-private partnership as a model uh, to address gaps in disaggregated uh, local decision-making. And uh, this actually was more influential, uh, both in my work and, and a lot of other work I observed in the regional governance and, and analysis space uh, subsequently than I had realized at that time. Uh, some of my work, for example, included leading a number of regional visioning efforts called Reality Check uh, with the ULI and Center for Smart Growth in Washington. And, and Chris uh, Nelson, who is here today as a speaker, was at Virginia Tech at that time, I believe, and, and we were collaborators on the Washington, D.C. Uh, piece of that ULI work. Uh, and we reconnected on that, actually, with some work with ULI Washington in a presentation a few years back. Um, I also 
subsequently pursued and followed scenario planning efforts across the region where Ted Knowlton and his colleagues work at Wasatch Front has been visible and, and leading in that regard. So it's, it's really been a great privilege uh, to now be a part of this community where a lot of national ideas and work uh, have, have come out of. Uh, so that's been sort of the practice-oriented dimension of, of my scholarly persona. On, on the more scholarly, kind of that regression analysis side, I am fundamentally a land policy scholar who looks at the supply side, uh, impact of zoning, subdivision regulations, et cetera, and how these impact prices, uh, but not just prices, production, uh, mix, uh, social impact opportunities, uh, and, and many other aspects of land use policy impact. And I tend to believe that to be, uh, to be successful, land policy should be looked at in the broader context of community outcomes. Uh, so um, when uh, I explore land use decisions, uh, I look at other things that land use decisions are affecting and are being affected by, including transportation choice, environmental outcomes, infrastructure efficiency, socioeconomic diversity, employment opportunities, and, and many other matters. And, and I will try to relate to some of these issues, the zoning reform conversations uh, that I'll address today. Um, I've worked on national studies, looking at regulatory barriers to affordable housing, different models of land use regulations and state mandates from inclusionary zoning to planning and developments to trans transit oriented developments and such. And, and a little bit of work on risk management for communities around housing uh, and housing foreclosures. Um, overall, I would say I'm a real advocate of planning and, and it's really great to meet so many planners here in the room, as well as all of you who are not planners but work with planners on a daily basis. Um, so it's not just about zoning reform or zoning changes, but collectively what can we create uh, or what can we do to create vibrant, uh, diverse, inclusive, prosperous communities in, in communities where we live, as well as our uh, future generations, uh, we hope, will also reside, as, as Madam Mayor pointed out. Um, so when I say think of missing middle housing, uh, I definitely see the value of considering zoning changes for, for missing middle housing. Um, but I feel that it will be even more successful uh, when it's pursued with alignment with market needs, uh, existing and future community preferences, and, and other dimensions of planning, some of which I'll try to address. To me, some of the discussions that uh, we're having on zoning reform, uh, to some extent actually is an advancement, to some extent perhaps even a repetition of, of discussions we've had be before around growth management, around smart growth, around new urbanism, new regionalism. Uh, but every generation of these conversations tend to take a, a different urgency, a, a different cultural uh, landscape, and a different sort of uh, needs of time. And, and in that regard, um, the conversations we're going to have today, I believe, uh, are, are really at a unique moment in time. So um, what I would like to address is first looking at why this is important from a national, um, sorry, I'm just gonna move my computer here slightly. Hopefully I won't turn over the entire setup. Yes, um, that's good, still there. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk at some national level numbers first. Uh, as many of you are probably already aware, there is urgency around the topic of housing crisis nationally, uh, as well as a strong momentum to respond which I think is reflected in, in our presence and, and work here today. Uh, while in the past, crises of this nature uh, have been more selective to specific areas, such as, say, the coastal communities, uh, this has become a national problem. Between 2021 and 2022, uh, 67 of the top 100 markets nationally experienced record high appreciation. I know some of that has gone down this year because of interest rates and such, uh, but it's still significantly higher than at any point in the past. Owner-occupied units hit 20% year-on-year increase nationally between 21 and 22. Rental units hit 12% nationally in many metros, I believe including SLC where it was closer to 20%. Um, and unlike in the past, um, these these situations do not indicate a bubble. 
Uh, there are a number of sustained drivers that are worrisome. Uh, for example, our economy continues to be robust, uh, but we aren't building enough houses. And we can examine some of the reasons behind that uh, shortly, and I'm sure we will. For first-time home buyers, there is huge competition from a lot of other segments, including global capital, all cash buyers, uh, VC firms that are these days identifying homes to buy using automated algorithms, institutional investors who are picking up single-family homes for rental markets, small-scale investors who are running Airbnbs. There's a lot of competition, and I've seen several articles recently that talk about how the idea of a starter home has essentially gotten kind of outmaneuvered by a number of other uh, phenomenons that are going on. Uh, there's, of course, the, the, the landscape of geographic reshuffling uh, of remote workers, partly as a, as a long-running impact of, of pandemic. Um, so, you know, when someone looks at a, 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 a local may not feel, may find a, a, a housing price extraordinary, but someone moving, say, from Seattle or San Francisco may not find that price extraordinary, and that really creates a mismatch in the housing market. Uh, there's a number of other related factors, including higher rents that are cutting into the savings uh, for down payments that people would otherwise accrue over the course of their, uh, their rental residency and ultimately move into a, a home ownership at a certain stage of their life or career. Um, demographic trends, including um, baby boomers living longer and living in their primary residence longer, thus reducing the supply for the next generation of uh, moving in home buyers. So there's a lot of phenomenon uh, that are involved here. It's not only zoning, but a lot of literature and increasing debates suggest that zoning constraints do play a role. Um, because zoning constraints ultimately limit, limit what you can build uh, and where you can build. Uh, and, and limit development, especially in areas that already have infrastructure and accessibility to jobs, which some of the ideas under the broader umbrella of zoning reform are trying to address. Um, this figure, for example, here highlights that while in the past home ownership has been uh, tracking home prices, the most recent crisis, home ownership has fallen, even though the home prices uh, are at historic highs. Uh, so there's a clear sort of mismatch there that's put in relief. So in short, the housing crisis is real. This is not just, there is just not enough homes to buy and lots of folks who need to buy and want to buy but cannot uh, just due to the high prices, low supply, low mix, uh, and bad rates. Uh, and, and hopefully the rate situation is going to be addressed in the coming year or two. And this lack of affordable uh, and attainable housing is damaging to communities, nationally, but also here. Uh, there are studies that show that lack of housing for a range of a region's residents can affect uh, the region's GDP, uh, attractiveness for industries, attracting and retaining talented uh, workers from beyond and even uh, local residents, supporting essential workers, uh, and especially, uh, this is an especially big problem for communities uh, that are lower income, uh, minority residents that are often facing displacement and dispossession. So there is a clear problem of home ownership mismatch and um, cost burden, especially on lower income renters and, and, and residents. So as a side note, actually, before I get into some data from, from Utah, uh, I worked about 10 years ago, uh, this was around the tail end of the foreclosure crisis, uh, on a project that showed another dimension of the risk of having low housing stock, uh, especially across a mix of spectrum. Um, we were looking at data of communities that were facing high foreclosure uh, rates and finding that uh, those communities uh, also had a lower mix of housing stock, were largely large lot, um, high, uh, large size homes, except for the apartment data. I mean, there's, of course, a lot of foreclosure in the lower income uh, price segment in the, in, the, in, the, in the apartment and condo residents. But on the, on the owned front, we're finding that just that lack of affordable housing, we're basically pushing people into buying housing that were beyond their means. 
And back then, this was obviously supported by mortgages that were cooked up in all sorts of ways to allow it. Thank God we have moved back a little bit in that regard. But essentially, people were pushed into riskier mortgages in larger homes that they could afford, largely because they could not find other kinds of homes that were better in their price spectrum. And as a result, when the triggering event happened, like a loss of job or an illness or a divorce, um, or their mortgage going underwater, those households were at an increased risk of foreclosure compared to those who were buying within their means, essentially middle income or upper middle income to upper income residents. So there's a, there's a lot of interconnected issues here, I think, that are relevant. But let's look at how some of these national trends um, are, are affecting Utah. I know other speakers will address this more squarely, and I'm probably going to get some of the things here wrong, and I would beg your patience if I do that. But I'm trying to make a little bit of a connection here. Um, but I, I think there is a significant case that the national sort of situation is strongly reflected here. Uh, the Gardner Policy Institute, uh, where we have several colleagues, uh, has released several studies uh, over the last couple of years, I believe, that are encapsulated in this figure. It shows the transformational demographic shifts that are underway in this region. Um, this is promising in many regards. This is a prosperous, thriving, vibrant region, which is growing, attracting industries, has a tremendous quality of life, a lot of natural amenities. So a lot of good things are going here. Uh, but there is a risk. There's a risk uh, that is particularly important in terms of continuing to attract in migration that has supplanted natural births as the main driver of growth. Um, there's risk in our housing stock accommodating the diverse practices and purchasing power of a multicultural community. Uh, there's risk of creating communities that allow aging in place, especially given the trends of different age cohorts in this community. And overall, just retaining the quality of life in this region that I'm sure we all value dearly. Um, good folks at Gardeners have even made some uh, easy to understand graphics for us that characterizes the story, I think, even more simply and uh, to me, scarily. Um, the housing prices, congestion, uh, and the environmental quality are significant threats to the growth uh, and sustainability of the quality of life in this region. Uh, and like the national trends, there is already some evidence of damage uh, that some of these trends are doing locally uh, due to lack of affordable housing or attainable housing. Uh, this again borrows from the work of gardeners, but also uh, Envision Utah, Workforce Services, and uh, Real Estate Consulting, uh, that, whose recent report shows significant deficits in rental inventories, especially for households who are 60% AMI or, or less, and very small amount of affordable homes in those price categories. And, and this is not just new homes. This includes uh, naturally occurring affordable housing and, and homes that are passing from one set of owners to another. Um, some of the work captured in recently released draft of the Salt Lake City's anti-displacement strategy, uh, which I understand includes work done by some of my colleagues and nurse while colleagues at, at the University of Utah, it clearly shows that uh, while we're working on higher density development, um, we need to look at uh, you know, some of the redevelopment and risk of displacement that are associated with redevelopment. Um, and how do you sort of preserve naturally occurring affordable housing as places uh, redevelop, turn over, densify, is going to be an important question that we need to keep in mind as we think about uh, some of the zoning reform efforts. Uh, I should also note that one of the things that uh, is pointed out to me by many locals uh, when they hear that I'm a planner and I'm a recent arrival uh, is how divided the community is uh, in socioeconomically between the east and, and west side, especially in the city. Uh, and, and as you know, zoning has historically been a tool for social exclusion. I don't know the specific uh, context of this community, but nationally there is evidence of zoning specifically def uh, denying African Americans and other minority groups access mortgage and properties uh, in predominantly white neighborhoods. And even though many of those overt policies are no longer constitutional, we continue to see sort of the lasting effects of the legacy of those pol policies in the structure of our urban landscapes. And as we have an opportunity to rethink and even reset zoning, this is something I would encourage us to keep in front of our, our minds as, 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 as an equity 
uh, centering approach uh, driving policy making. So um, that was, I'd admit, a, a long background on urgency of responding to the housing crisis, especially through land use instruments. Uh, I know many of you are familiar with the subject of zoning reform, um, and other speakers will cover local examples, but I wanted to share a bit of a primer uh, on the matter, uh, on this topic. I'm a professor, bear with me, but I think it's also might helpful to kind of set us some, some baseline of, of what we are talking about here. Um, so, unfortunately, in, in some circles, zoning reform, I think, has become a bit of a contentious and scary term, um, often characterized by one of the two following things. Uh, to some, it sounds like state preemption. Uh, that could come in many forms, like standards to uh, policies that are carrots or sticks, uh, with the goal of setting zoning and housing-related expectations among local communities and municipalities. I would admit that it is true that these are forms of zoning reform, uh, but definitely not the only kind. In places where problems are especially acute, uh, and localities have not attempted to address them seriously or consistently or sustainably, um, I think there is significant sort of, uh, you know, rationale to considering the idea of regional agencies or state agencies sort of thinking about how they can facilitate and support this work. Um, but I think it's also important to think about other ways of pursuing this, especially under the local government structure. Um, so that's sort of one way to think about this that's, I think, pretty commonly um, understood, though may not be complete or totally accurate. And on the other hand, especially in academic circles, where I tend to lurk more frequently, um, some have called for abolishing single-family zoning. That's kind of how zoning reform is thought of. Single-family zoning has had a lot of problems. Let's just get rid of it. Um, these calls often critique, you know, some of the things I've already said, like disproportionate amount of land zoned in U.S. municipalities as R1. Now, you've probably seen the maps that show 65% to someone even, somewhere even upward of 90% land in many large American cities are exclusively single-family zoned. And that essentially limits what you can do and where you can do it, and those areas are not often the areas that have accessibility, have uh, infrastructure capacity have opportunities for future residents. So there is a clear mismatch that supports this idea of abolishing single-family zoning. Um, there's, of course, the other side of it, which is also um, the role that some argue uh, and have found evidence of where zoning has created segregated communities with high variation in educational quality, uh, public services, uh, and job opportunities. So, personally, I think these critiques are justified, but the idea of abolishing single-family zoning needs to be considered uh, with regard to specific markets, political environments, displacement concerns, trade-offs, and the need for additional planning. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation, but I would say that in addition to these two things, there's a lot that's, I think, falls under the umbrella of zoning reform. Of course, in addition to abolishing single-family zoning, one could also reduce it, targeted areas uh, where these are pursued through upzoning, through specific uh, uh, alterations and such. So that's sort of, I would say, a broader characterization of, of zoning specific changes within the context of zoning reform. But there's a whole lot of other areas. Another tool is abolishing or reducing parking minimums. The idea of a private automobile remains a strong one and uh, close to the idea of property rights, I would say, but there has been some shift in the necessity of high off-street parking, um, including some contributed by the work of Donald Shoup. Um, so reducing parking requirement, I believe, has really opened up as a significant um, you know, opportunity to, to create a room for subdividing lots, uh, adding more units, and integrating with shared ridership and, and transit services and such. So that's another area that falls under zoning reform. Um, another one that you all, I believe, talked about last year is uh, the missing middle housing. I think it's part of the zoning reform's toolbox, allowing duplexes, triplexes, and more by right, especially in areas with abundant infrastructure, uh, can be significantly beneficial to producing housing uh, and to, to addressing the need, especially areas that have accessibility. One of the concerns that I've found often cited in allowing missing middle apart, uh, such as apartment, 
uh, is whether they will negatively impact the value of surrounding properties. This, I think, remains a fundamental challenge in the political space of pursuing many of the zoning reform-related policies. Uh, I'd be honest, I have not seen a whole lot of clear evidence to support this fear, especially if the development is well-designed and integrated within the urban landscape and, and with other planning efforts. I think you all discussed this in a lot of detail last year, and I, I, I viewed some of those conversations. Um, and indeed, locally, a 2021 study by the Gardner Institute that I found showed that apartments built between 2010 and 2018 uh, have not reduced single-family home values uh, within half mile of those apartments in suburban Salt Lake County locations. I think that's encouraging when it comes to promoting uh, missing middle housing uh, in, in this community. And of course, um, there's ADUs. This is a part of this. Utah, I think, is a leader in this space. Uh, as I was looking for a home for my family, I came across a lot of places that have ADUs. Uh, yeah, this is a significant and I think highly welcome way for individual households to find affordable units. Um, and if you are the main homeowner, it's a way to kind of offset some of your uh, mortgage. But as we were talking about at dinner last night, I mean, there's a lot of additional pieces to it. The banking sector sort of kind of understanding how this works. How do you finance a structure in a property that's not your own? Uh, so there are some streamlining that needs to happen, and, and perhaps the state and local governments could work together in advancing some of that work. Um, another area which I think would fall under the context of zoning reform um, and is a massive, massive opportunity right now, given sort of the post-pandemic industrial sort of culture, uh, is zoning for adaptive reuse. Uh, we know that there's a lot of vacant commercial space, um, thanks to remote work again and other economic and cultural shifts. And not all of these spaces, I would admit, are easily or even cheaply convertible. Uh, but allowing such conversion by right or by, you know, uh, limited oversight could open up a lot of significant synergies in areas especially that have existing infrastructure. So I would, I would throw this in the mix. And, and lastly, of course, there is the piece around state preemption. Um, state preemption, again, I don't think is a tool per se, uh, but it is, I think of it as a regulatory scale at which any or all of the above tools may be adopted, suggested, regulated, pursued. Um, and while I'm covering this overview, I wanted to point out that, you know, it's sort of, this is one dimension of thinking about what are the different tools or instruments or pieces when it comes to zoning reform, but there's multiple other dimensions that we as planners and local level practitioners and decision makers need to think about. And, and one of those is like, what are you doing this for and how do you connect each of these ideas to different, different purposes or goals? And I found some good advice in the literature that I thought would be worth sharing here. Uh, one set of advice comes from Urban Institute and Turner Center for Housing Innovation at uh, UC Berkeley, which suggests, you know, you need to not just think about zoning reform, but also what goals are these reforms serving? And these goals could be about general production, where the idea is just to increase the supply of housing. Uh, and the idea is just increasing supply will affect prices, a clear sort of economic model. Uh, but some communities may have more specific goals around pursuing affordable housing. Uh, because their workforce can't find places to live. They're becoming less attractive to essential workers um, because of the really mismatch in the kind of, kind of housing stock. So specific purposes like affordable housing, fair housing, or even if your goals are broader to pursue smart growth or sustainability in the community, you could think of this as sort of another dimension and pick and choose a collection of zoning reform policies that suit your particular goals and your particular context. Another way to think about it is the market segment. Um, this may seem repetitive from my definitional slides, uh, but I suggest it again here as, you know, the housing product that you're creating, ADUs, missing middle, uh, multifamily, affordable units, emergency shelters, they are all targeting different price segments, demographic groups potentially, um, age-based communities and such. And as such, they need to fit into your broader plan 
uh, in different ways. So this is sort of another way to think about what's your goal, what are you pursuing, and what are the tools you have. So it's a bit of a triangulation from, from that standpoint. And um, just to kind of close the loop on that state preemption point, or any sort of state involvement point, not necessarily preemption, um, is that you know, they're often accompanied by some standards that come based on empirical examples in other states like Colorado or Wyoming or Maine or Washington, Oregon, what have you. So a number of states, including Utah, have, have made some advances in this regard. And, and they come on a broad spectrum. There are standards, there are technical assistance, but one could also organize the existing policies between some sticks and carrots kind of an approach. Um, on the carrot side, I would say, you know, there are programs that fit this idea of um, receiving funding to pursue specific housing or planning needs. Um, I would imagine the Utah State funding, again, I'm new here, so forgive me if I'm characterizing this incorrectly, to pursue some affordable housing um, goals within specific communities could fall, fall under that category. Uh, it's essentially funding. But I don't know yet uh, what are some of the sort of, um, you know, expectations attached to that funding. Um, municipalities may also receive new or additional powers to pursue land use outcomes in a state sort of carrot approach. On the stick side, we found some examples in the literature that includes fines for non-compliance regarding housing goals or housing assessments and then meeting those assessments, withholding funds from jurisdictions for non-compliance or giving developers some remedies uh, when the local government or local agencies are not aligned with the state goals or standards. So there's a lot in here. This is a very developing sort of field. And I would say, you know, uh, just before this, uh, one other thing. Most state efforts in this area seem to come with exemptions as well, sort of escape hatches. Right? If your municipalities have a strong reason not to do what the state is suggesting, there are examples that would you know, say, okay, you can override municipal, um, override that state expectation through municipal override votes, or uh, a community could get rewarded for, for achievements. And I have the study cited here. I don't have specific examples to point out in this case, but if you look at some of these studies, you will find specific examples. They are most often from the coast at this time, uh, but since sort of an interesting developing field, I would say. Um, I have not seen a lot of studies that look at the estimate of impacts of either local efforts in zoning reform yet or state effort. I think it's a little too soon uh, to do that. Maybe there are some studies that I haven't come across, I haven't been able to find yet. Uh, but a lot of studies really look at, you know, just summarizing the nature of existing programs, either state or at local levels or both, uh, including uh, the summary from a report that the Lincoln Institute convened earlier this year uh, that shows how different states are pursuing um, these different goals, overall growth, affordable housing, or through accessory dwelling units or missing metal, uh, and whether they're mandatory, whether they're incentive-based, whether they're more of a technical assistance in setting standards. Um, it shows, for example, that the state of Utah's current efforts do not uh, include overall production or missing metal uh, at, at the state level. Um, I don't know Utah well enough, again, uh, to know if this is accurate, uh, but one thing I would add that uh, this doesn't really tell you, just looking at a sh graph like that, what are the actual expectations, what are the workabilities, how would it play in the local community, and, and how do you sort of fine-tune these policies that may meet state expectations while at the same, same time actually advancing the housing needs of your community instead of just checking a box. So there's a lot, lot more here than, than, than I'm covering, but this is just an overview. Um, forgive me, just a second. So I think um, this last set of slides I have here, let me just do a time check quickly. Um, I want to discuss a few questions that come up frequently um, in, in the research space related to zoning reform. And they are about the details of the programs themselves, how communities are developing it, how they are taking these through the political process, who is involved, what makes for a strong, um, achievable program versus what's 
might be more of a meeting the boxes of, of a higher level agency's expectations. Um, and then there is the set of questions that relate to, well, is this sufficient? Is this actually going to be enough to do uh, what's needed? Um, and, and I collected a bunch of questions in this regard that may be just sort of very partial and preliminary, but might be worth thinking about. And one of those questions often comes up is, okay, you can remove the barriers, but is it actually going to create uh, or support the conditions needed to develop and then market the kind of housing that this zoning change is intended to facilitate? So it's sort of a three step. Will the developers build it and will someone actually buy those houses? And developers obviously understand this a lot better probably than practitioners. So, so it's sort of under, important to, to work with this together. And I would say that a few years back, I would have probably said, um, I don't know if, Amer if enough American households are interested in multifamily apartments to kind of wholesale change the zoning pattern. Uh, and there's a sort of political capital expenditure here to pursue the zoning patterns. I would have expected or recommended, you know, some case-by-case -case approach. But, you know, given what we have seen with the housing crisis in the last few years, I feel the pendulum has swung quite strongly on this. And especially in the Salt Lake City area, it feels like the local data on multifamily housing production and multifamily housing sales support this idea that yeah, if you create significant good stock, accompany it with good planning, there's probably a strong market for it. Uh, it's not going to be, you know, you can't pop it up wherever away from everything else, but in desirable areas combined with the right amenities, working with the developers, transportation, parking, accessibility recommendations and expectations. Yeah, this can be marketable. Um, again, I'm new, but that's what I feel like. Another situation I, uh, is... You know, will the zoning reform improve housing equity? And will it bring lower income residents closer to opportunity? I'm actually more skeptical about this question. Um, I have seen 800K houses demolished and developed into two subdivided laws that sell for 660K. Right? So collectively, it's a marketable opportunity. Communities develop probably more tax returns. There is more housing. So there is certainly some benefit to that. It's not going to help the 60% AMI household. So, you know, projecting that change as something that builds equity, I think, is sort of a debatable proposition. So the question is, how do you balance the need for communities that are facing displacement and lower income residents that really need housing with the more housing production and redevelopment oriented ideas? And I think that, you know, there is some middle ground here, which is you could pursue subdividing opportunities and redevelopment but you need to put sufficient protection for displacement and redirect some of the funds you generate from there through cross subsidies, creating you know, special funds for affordable housing, whatnot, and there are models for that, to really serving the community that could be getting displaced and is not really being served by the equity argument that one could be making. Um, so there, there's some interesting debates to be had there, I think. Uh, and another question that I've already discussed is, you know, whether this jurisdiction-wide change, um, um, sorry, whether this zoning reform will actually impact existing property values. This is, of course, sort of um, the first thing that often comes up in, in public meetings. And I think we need even more evidence on this, and I encourage folks who are sort of tracking the local data, uh, and if I get time from my dean responsibilities, I want to pursue some of this research. But I think there's good research to be done here. Now that we are seeing missing middle housing develop, is what impact are they having on surrounding communities? I feel like our housing equity has improved so much in the last two, three years. The home buyers have gained so much from the market. And if we are to pursue the idea of social contract, uh, contract in the community, we need to think about not just in terms of, well, is it going to continue developing uh, single family housing values in the same way, or are we going to understand some sort of compromise that overall moves us forward as a community? So, you know, I think this is not a settled question, but with good planning and sufficient consideration and consensus building, there may be opportunities here to pursue. And 
One of the other questions that has come up, especially in the state role in this, is whether sort of allowing communities or forcing communities to make jurisdiction-wide change is a better strategy than POD or piecemeal changes to zoning. And I'm not a legal expert, obviously, but I think this is an interesting question, right? Um, do you want some support to make this change of allowing you know, two units by right in single family detached units and whether you want to do that on a case by case basis or a community wide basis and, and state support to make it community wide basis might be more legally defensible than doing it on a case by case basis. So that's kind of one of the interesting questions I think in the land use law space over here. So finally, um, I want to sort of make two comments that get at, well, how do you sort of take all of these structures and, and, and ways to think about it, and some of the questions that are really urgent in this regard, and, you know, come up with some recommendations. I don't have a lot of specific recommendations. I just wanted to raise some questions and encourage uh, some thinking and conversation. And I'm sure when other panelists speak more specifically about Utah, or when we have a panel discussion later, there will be opportunities for, for more specific recommendations. But in the broader space, I would, I would argue or, or suggest, you know, um, one could ask if zoning reform ideas are sufficient to address our housing crisis. And, and I think there are two sides to this, and we need to be very careful about how we address each of these sides. Uh, and I would say the first answer is no. Zoning reform itself is not sufficient to address the housing crisis. Um, we need to do a lot more than zoning. I think Zoning reform is an essential or a necessary step to address the housing crisis, but it is not sufficient. We need to think about how do we coordinate development that includes amenities and opportunities and not just creates a bunch of multifamily housing in the middle of nowhere in, that, in, in land that nobody else wants. Uh, we need to continue watching our housing inventory in ways that aligns them with our goals. And our goals may be overall production, or it may be generating better mix, or it may be generating more fair housing. Uh, we need to continue to conduct periodic reviews and policy adjustments in response to how this is evolving, and how the market and demographics are evolving. And largely, I think planners need to work with designers and developers and advocates to figure out what's needed in every community in addition to zoning transformation um, that, that helps make all of these communities attractive, vibrant, and sustainable over a long term. So I will stop here with those thoughts, and I'd encourage you know, some thinking and invite your questions, and hopefully uh, this will be a useful start to the conversation of the day we have ahead of us. Thanks a lot. Okay, now we have some time for Q&A, so we're, we have two people roaming with um, mics at this time. So if you'd like to ask any questions, please raise your hand and we'll get the mic to you. Um, and we have our first question. And, and may I suggest that in addition to question, if you have comments or reactions, you're welcome to share that as well. I hope that's okay, Helen. Yes, certainly, an open forum is great. Hello, um, really great um, summary of the research here. Curious in the body of your research how, how uh, connection to transportation policy decisions, has that been a layer of the research that you've conducted as you've st does study the literature on zoning reform for housing? How is that connected to any transportation related impact, you know, changes as well? Thank you for that question. Um, I think that's, that's an important, if not essential, piece of this. Um, you know, when we were talking about smart growth almost 20 years ago, uh, we were talking about not just housing, creating a good housing mix, providing transportation accessibility, creating a range of transportation options, protecting environmental impact and environmental amenities, they were all connected. And the idea is it's not just developing higher density units or creating opportunities for smaller uh, additional units, but also how do you serve those units? And transportation is an important component of that. There are some you know, uh, tools to do that. The general plan is the place to do that. Um, tying consistency and concurrency between your land use and, and transportation and other elements of plans are ways to do that. Uh, funding 
transportation decisions in a way that advance land use outcomes and making land use decisions in ways that advance transportation goals are ways to do that. Um, specifically, you know, I think um, the parking minimum change requirement would be an example. Yes, parking minimum has been advocated as sort of one in the package of zoning reform, but people are still gonna need to move about. And so thinking about, you know, whether this is a household that doesn't have the same traditional, you know, one and a half car or whatever, and commute using bikes or buses or trains, how those movement patterns are integrated into the development locations and decisions is important. So this is what I think I meant when I said, you know, uh, good planning is important and, and considering transportation integrated with land use decisions, I would certainly count as, as an aspect of good planning. Thank you. Carlton, I'll just right on over here. Hey, Jason. I just wondered in your analysis, um, the actual availability of labor to construct housing. Uh, I've noticed in our own work that we're having a difficult time even getting contractors to bid on large projects, and and I, I realize it's a trickle-down availability, and so actual product construction, I wondered if what your analysis or thought was along that line. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. And that has been sort of a, a significant challenge, I would understand, and uh, I'm sure those from development space know this better, in the housing price appreciation, in addition to the, you know, the, the supply chain shortages. And I personally have not analyzed that or looked at it closely in, in research but I suspect, you know, there's sort of a, a cyclical nature to this. You know, we need to create uh, workforce housing so we can attract and retain folks who work in the construction sector and then sort of create those opportunities. From the cost front, you know, I, I, I think, you know, if, if construction cost and construction cost escalations are factored in, um, financing and support mechanisms by state governments where they exist in, in, in low-income housing finance decisions. If that's a way to do that, that'd be another way to bring in the construction cost and labor uh, in the calculation. But this is an area I know very little about, uh, and I would be very keen on you know, how those who are familiar with this sort of think this could be, you know, work collaboratively between planners and developers on how construction cost factors in, you know, development. The, the obvious, sorry, I'm kind of rambling here a little bit, but the obvious, uh, one other obvious area is this question of cross-subsidizing, which is you build housing of multiple kinds and you kind of, you know, generate the profit from one to serve the other in a way that helps you pursue a broader housing mix. So I'm Alan Ormsby with AARP. We've done a lot of work on missing middle housing. And the slide that you showed that had all those different comparisons from states, and it showed the, obviously that we didn't have a whole lot of missing middle housing starts or whatever it was that they were counting. Do you think that is because of zoning problems that the missing middle housing, or are there other market factors that are keeping Utah from building, or I don't know if, uh, you know, re refixing or reconnecting uh, communities to have more missing middle housing? So, um, I don't know specifically about Utah, but in general, I, I wouldn't, you know, blame zoning uh, for, for, as the only one for that. Uh, I've seen studies that show you know, even areas close to transit stations nationally um, have predominantly single-family zoning uh, and single-family development. And, and that, in part, is sort of a legacy of the way we have done zoning and kind of retrofitting the transit st structure within that landscape and not changing the zoning to really, you know, capitalize on the value that's created in the land uh, because of those investments. And I think that's changing. I think with more missing middle housing being developed across the nation in, in all sorts of communities, we're going to see evidence of, of how, you know, uh, 
zoning change could be one factor in, in, in creating that market. Um, but, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, based on your work and, and AARP's sort of work with creating communities for healthy aging and aging in place, there is, uh, you know, a, a very urgent need to create communities where, you know, you can live across your life stages. Uh, but our, our, most of our communities are not suited for that. Even in big cities, 60 to 90 percent of the land is owned single family. Suburbs, obviously, a lot more. So, you know, we tend to move from community to community as we go through different stages of life. And that has a social impact on the fabric of our society. And uh, I think Missing Middle is a good way to respond to that, especially communities that have transit, access, amenities, um, and, and, and more affordable homes. Uh, I, I, I don't know if zoning can be the only one to be blamed for that, but there's obviously studies that show opportunities for zoning change that could contribute to reversing, reversing that trend. And thank you for your work with that. Actually, I'm familiar with Rodney Harrell in the DC office of AARP, who has done some work on, on the indexes and measures. He was a classmate of mine at, at Maryland. So it your comment just reminded me of an old friend. So thank you. Yes. Hi there. Uh, Megan McKenna, I'm a housing advocate for Mountainlands Community Housing Trust, a nonprofit on the Wasatch back. And um, my question is, and, and I really appreciate this presentation, so thank you. Um, what do you think is, uh, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on how to best approach this from a, a regional level when I, I feel like so often our, our cities and our towns and counties, they have a housing department, you know, transportation, um, planning. What, what support do you think is needed or, or what system that we don't have in place currently to better support, you know, all of those working better together, but then also on a, a regional scale? That seems to be such a, a large barrier. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Megan. Um, you know, we were talking about this just yesterday about how transportation decision making, which is a lot more uh, centralized and coordinated across a region, if not the whole state, uh, works differently than land use, where land use decisions that are connected to property rights tend to be seen differently, have a different history of how they are connected locally. But there's clearly you know, the need for thinking about housing markets don't stop at municipal boundaries. And there's a lot of spillover and interconnections uh, both between and among municipalities as well as between domains like housing and transportation. Um, I've seen communities where regional agencies that were established largely as transportation planning agencies have over time developed strong housing aspects. Um, some of it comes from top down or more top down, um, you know, establishment or mandate. Some of it is more sort of a governance model where communities get together to think about regional um, shared interest. Uh, I, I'm sure organizations like Wasatch Front Regional Council or Envision Utah have tried to convene or maybe have been successful in convening those regional discourses. I'm, I'm not, unfortunately, uh, very familiar with the local area. But I would certainly, uh, I, I think there are great examples of thinking about this. Um, in a way that could even start with just understanding, you know, what the different interests are, how they affect one another, um, and what are the benefits versus costs or trade-offs of making uh, decisions that are more coordinated regionally versus not. Um, there are some communities where this is, you know, done through a hierarchy of plans that are going from neighborhood to municipality to region to state levels. Uh, again, this is something I need to learn more about, how it's done in Utah. Uh, but I would, I would strongly support, you know, the idea of thinking about housing needs regionally, thinking about fair share of housing for each community across different price segments, and thinking about how technical assistance, data, you know, uh, past studies could be coordinated across the different agencies, both horizontally and vertically. And I think you know, housing advocates and neighborhood advocates, transportation advocates, all have a strong role to coordinate and collaborate and contribute in this. Yeah. 
Dr. Uh, Chakraborty, thank you so much for your presentation. I uh, very much appreciate that. I'd, I'd like to ask you a question about the geography of zoning reform. So here in the Wasatch Front, the greater Wasatch Front, we have uh, a shared vision that we've all come together behind called the Wasatch Choice Vision, and that includes city and town centers, transit-oriented development. Now, where zoning reform occurs, it differs in terms of the political difficulty of making it occur. You know, it's going to vary, you know, one city to another, but also in different parts of the city. So I guess my question is, I'm trying to figure out an artful way of communicating it, but if you're, tr if you're going to advise a local government representative about where the costs of the political costs, let's say, versus the benefits, the best locations that really maximize the advantage, is the recommendation, you know, try it everywhere, focus in particular locations. Where's the cost benefit advantage geographically? It's a great question. It's a hard one. Um, you know, um, Conceptually, we can think of how coordinating this regionally in that choice and then corridors and areas with specific, you know, additional infrastructure need, accessibility could fit in to make it a more targeted kind of an approach. Uh, but as you, you know, say, the political feasibility and the feeling of urgency in different communities and, and where this fits within other priorities tend to kind of ultimately determine you know, where uh, the efforts of individual communities would go. Uh, I think there is, uh, there's probably, you know, there is some value in being kind of iterative and discursive about it. So as a regional agency, you could continue to push certain areas of priority and then create or facilitate, you know, opportunities for local agencies to think about how to bring those ideas into their higher priority items. Um, you know, I, I think this is what I was referring to in part in that jurisdictional Y change versus TOD and some, you know, more incremental change. It's not exactly what you're talking about, but that is sort of another dimension of it. Do you want to adopt a, a city-wide change where you just go from single family to two to three unit by right, or do you just identify targeted areas uh, and, and, and that may be something you study at the regional scale. Um, I think, you know, there are, there is, there is, seems to be significant um, need for it um, to, to make the community more attractive and more sustainable, just generally. That was sort of the argument behind the housing crisis. And, you know, the, this is an opportunity for communities to build up their tax base, to, you know, to capitalize on areas with existing infrastructure, to make the political case for change through some studies that show that, you know, the, some of the fears may not be um, totally backed up by evidence. And if we do it correct, correctly and collectively, you know, the, the, the impact is, is not as what one might fear. Um, I'm kind of dancing around your question, I realize. Uh, but I think, you know, more directly, um, this, is, this is the nature of it. I mean, if, if there is no, I mean, one could say a more state level, you know, intervention advocate might say, this is some of the value of having state mandate. But that's, that, there's a problem to that, which is a one-size-fits-all rule that may not kind of apply to every community. And the communities might still find a way to get out of those mandates by checking boxes, and you're still left with a more fragmented landscape. So I think regional agencies have a lot of intermediate role to play here to facilitate and, and support communities. But there's also an opportunity to get ahead of, you know, potential state mandates or expectation by showing that this is important to the community. Here is how to keep community priorities and, and interests in front of it while serving you know, the broader benefit of the region. So I think every, every player has a role to play in it. Yeah. Yes, um, this is Kathy Richardson from West 
Jordan, City of West Jordan. Um, let me see if I can state my question or my, my statement. <laughs> Um, affordable housing, even with these middle housing developments or um, apartments or um, other, you know, medium density housing, it's still very expensive. Um, so my question about providing housing for people um, is partly dependent on what's being developed, you know, however, it's just that people can't afford homes. Yeah. Um, they, their, their jobs aren't, um, you know, high paying. The middle class to lower class, the incomes haven't risen hardly at all through the years. And if you did a study on that, it's probably even worse than ever. Yeah. Um, part of it is, you know, they don't have the skills. Our culture, you know, does not, um, help people to be able to afford homes. So I'm just wondering, To and people do prefer to live in single family homes, um, and good planning is important. I think we need to have a mixture of restaurants and stores and whatever, you know. But I think the problem with increased housing prices so for the people who can afford them or could afford them is that there's lack of housing, yeah. lack of single family yeah. housing. And I think that trying to create this sustainability or this equity is kind of a unattainable mm. um, utopia, I guess, or it's, and it, and it, um, it's not what people want. What do you think? Yeah, I appreciate the comment. Um, I mean, one of the distinctions I was trying to make, you know, I, I tried to focus my remarks on, on ideas around zoning reform. Um, I could try to cobble together a whole other presentation on, you know, how to create affordable housing, and, and especially for communities that will not be served by market-priced housing. Uh, there are policies and programs around protecting naturally occurring affordable housing. There's policies and programs around, you know, providing support for low-income housing finance and, and how to take advantage of federal and state programs and local programs. In terms of the question that, you know, this may be unattainable, um, I think that's a great question for all of us to ponder, right? I mean, we have attempted things, I think, as public professionals, as planners in particular, we have a social responsibility to kind of pursue the, 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 the you know, interest of the broad spectrum of our community and especially be mindful of the needs and, and history of those who are the neediest in our community. So I think we need to keep working and, and not feel hopeless or unattainable. Uh, but you know, I think there are significant challenges. You know, whatever we can do to advance this cause is good, but I think working together and being strategic, we can do more than working, you know, in our own silos and on smaller goals. But thank you for that question. Okay, thank you, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed this morning's uh, speaker, and let's give him another uh, thank you. Thank you. One of the things that inspired me to try to convince my colleagues that let's take on a conversation about zoning reform here today at Regional Solutions is the fact that there's a new federal competitive grant program to help communities decide how they want to uh, be able to um, have more affordable housing, have greater choices. And uh, the program is called uh, Pathways to Removing Obstacles to Housing Program, or pro-housing. And so I, uh, there was just a deadline for this grant. I don't know if anybody applied for that or not locally. Oh, look, we've got a city. Tell me who you're with. State Office of Homeless, State Office of Homeless Services. There we go. So thank you for doing that. Um, because what I'd like to do is to start to gather some people and start to have this discussion about 
how do we have housing that's more affordable and more choices in each community for a community priorities, with considering community priorities, because each one is very different. So with that said, it's time for lunch. Um, it's just out in the hallway, buffet style. So please enjoy your lunch, and we'll start with our uh, morning, sp uh, with our luncheon speaker, our keynote from the Atlantic, uh, Jerusalem Demsis. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>